Railway Conversations with Doc Frank. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the show. This is a second part of my conversation with Charles Page, which I already featured in the last episode 69. I hope you enjoyed that one. The conversation today was actually the pre-talk before the conversation of the last episode. And I decided to keep this and make this into a separate short episode simply because the topics that we addressed were so interesting and so important for our industry. The first topic we talk about is the effects two employees working on bids, on tenders, regardless whether that tender will be won or lost. And the other topic is about the effects that the pandemic left to the structure of workplaces. I hope you enjoy and take something of value out of it. Hi, this is Doc Frank again. I need to tell you about my brand new online ETCS training. It's the online version of the well-proven ETCS Kickstarter live training that has helped more than 200 railway professionals in Australia and New Zealand, regardless of their prior knowledge of signaling. So that really means you can learn the fundamentals of the European train control system, even if you didn't have any signaling knowledge before the training. How good is that? There's an online study group for networking during the training and I also provide an industry-leading support of questions and answers, not just during your training, but also for a guaranteed minimum of 12 months after the training. People who can register before the 31st of May get a very special early mover discount. So don't hesitate and sign up now at docfranktraining.podia.com slash ETCS. That's docfranktraining.podia.com slash ETCS. Burnt out. And um, you, you, you can trace crises in their life, changes in their career, going off and doing other things um, from having been involved in, in a, a major losing losing bid. I remember when um, even when we won on uh, the original uh, Dandenong Transformation project and then um, the, the bid went in and uh, literally hours after the bid went in, it was announced that, you know, thank you very much. We let you complete the process, but we're canceling this this bid process. Um, it it is really a roller coaster ride, and it really is uh, intellectually and emotionally punishing. And uh, not enough companies sort of real realize what they're doing to their staff, um, and and don't provide any sort of support for them. In fact, of course, when somebody loses, there's um, quite often a uh, oh look, if it's a good company, it's not a witch hunt, but um, likely to be you know, post-mortems and whatever that actually drag it out. And, and um, uh, yeah, I, I I just think that, uh, you know, all this are you OK stuff and, um, and concerns about mental health, or whatever, that, that's just a topic that hasn't been discussed yet. Yeah. Well, especially if you're losing, then there's often or in the past, at least there has been often a search for a culprit. Like what went wrong, which at the end of the day often means who did something wrong or who did something not as good as it could have been, which may have potentially won well, us the, the bit. All with hindsight. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, and, and I can fully subscribe to what you said uh, to the uh, emotional difficulties when you put a lot of effort into something like this into a bit and uh, and then it's not it's not happening it's not eventuating so so i remember one of the first things when i migrated to australia was that i worked on a bit for uh, cbd metro in sydney um which at the time was the plan for the first stage of sydney metro which then later was was turned into into northwest and and i spent 
a year roughly first on the expression of interest and then uh, I was one in one of the two shortlisted teams so very similar to what Siemens now went through in in Perth and a couple of weeks before the tender submissions were due the government pulled the plug on this project so so there wasn't really anything while well, Post mortem, why did you lose it? But but the emotional effects were still tremendous because I was, for me personally, I was meant to have um, a, a serious role on the delivery team, and afterwards yeah. it was going into operation and maintenance. So so I was basically hoping for the next like twenty twenty five years of my career spending on this project under the premise that we would win it. And and we were, of, of course, optimistic that we would win it. Um, and so, and, and that basically dissolved like within an hour. So we were notified one afternoon at two o'clock in the afternoon that all work on the tender has to be ceased by 3 p.m. the same day. And yeah. and I, I had contractors in the office who were literally crying, like with tears and, and everything, because they were hoping to earn enough money from the bidding activity to go for the first time on a trip to Europe and something like that. So, so I, I asked the girl, why, why are you crying? And ah, now I can't travel to Europe because I, I don't earn the money that, that I needed for that. If that had continued for another two weeks, then it would have been enough. Yeah. So yeah, yeah the, the emotional effects are really quite, quite severe. And, um, and also, it's a characteristic of these sorts of bids that quite often you've got staff who are going to relocate. They're going to you know, come from Europe to, to Australia, whatever. Yeah. And for the time scales of lots of these these bids, um, you know, their their homes are half packed up, you know, or, or that they 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 the, the families have all in the wife will uh, uh, husband who who wasn't employed in the railways, uh, the trailing spouse will have told their employer, you know, to they're going or they're, 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 the kids have told their friends at school or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's devastating. Yeah. 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 I, I had someone on the podcast uh, recently, well, recently, a few months ago, and uh, she was headhunted from the UK to come to Australia to work on the Melbourne Airport Rail Project. And then she was here for like six months and then the government pulled the plug on that project. And yep. And that meant she lost her job. And then due to visa regulations, she had, I think, four four weeks to find something new or otherwise get deported from Australia. And and, and this is you you may say that's an extreme example, but but I what you just said about relocation, I think that happens quite often actually. And uh, and and the there's another effect as well, is that uh, when governments pull the plug on a project or trying to do some start stop activity like like turning a water tap on and off uh resources just leave they they just go elsewhere where the work is and then when they try to turn it back on like i don't know 6 months 12 months 2 years later the resources are gone yeah, I mean that you yeah. always find stuff working on a project. That's for sure. So, so you will never be left with nothing. But what definitely happens is you have to start from scratch again. So, so anything you had before in terms of a learning curve that has all uh, vanished. Yeah. So. And oh, that that's uh, the the story of the the Australian market. That um, it is a small market. However, uh, major these projects seem. It is a small market, um, and it's all or nothing for, for a lot of these, these bids. And, um, yeah, it, it has a disproportionately high impact on, on the people working on these, these jobs and a disproportionately a difficult process to restart a bid. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you see in the run-up to, to major bids, the, the customers going around the world trying to drum up interest, trying to get anybody to bid, for some of them. Um, and how will those companies sort of feel if the process is mismanaged? And I'm thinking particularly of those projects that are cancelled or rescheduled or whatever. Um, yeah. that, that really damages Australia's credibility and um, you know, the willingness of... Uh, companies to invest in pursuing work um, when there's more reliable markets elsewhere in the world. Yes. 
yes, yes, yes. And and companies I mean, get this as, as far as the as bidding well. is concerned, though. The companies involved do need to um, recognize the impact on on their staff, and um, yeah, be sensitive to 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 what they've committed and to their own mental state and uh, how um, their behavior in, in the post-bid period, um, post-mortems, yes, but witch, witch hunts, no, and, and appreciate that um, those involved um, are incredibly sensitive to witch hunts and to any suggestion of it. And, uh, you know, the, the, the board may be dispassionate about you know um, the review process but they're not dealing with dispassionate people you ask them to be passionate about winning this and you can't be surprised if um, they're hypersensitive to uh, being interrogated over the ins and outs of it yes Yes, yeah, absolutely absolutely and and I think it's a fine balance there which requires maybe some kind of mind shift from parts of the management to on the one hand really getting to the bottom of things especially if you lost something and and you you thought you you would have won it or you should have won it or what whatever what went wrong um but but at the same time also being conscious of as you said the emotions of the people that spent a lot of work there like um i am mean, very very often and and you probably know this better than anyone a lot of people spend enormous amounts of work during a bid phase because of deadlines that need to be met on client requests that need to be answered overnight um where you can't just say well we just handball that stuff over to europe they work during the night and then the next morning we get a perfect response that we can just hand over to the client this is not how it works yeah so so at the very least you need to spend a lot of time locally to to basically refine it and and put it in a language that the client will appreciate and understand and everything and uh yeah so there's a there's a lot of work involved and um so so people are exhausted after a process like this plus they are they are heavily disappointed because of the loss and then uh yeah so so their rest and recovery plus the emotional rebuild shall we say our recovery is is really really very important yeah and and i i hope that i mean I'm not sure what you've seen in in Siemens most recently. I I watched it from a distance. Obviously, I worked in Siemens myself for many many years, more than 17, uh, which is nothing close to your career at, at Siemens or predecessor companies. But but still, for me, it was the longest career stay ever. And um, what I've seen from the distance, what Siemens did, for example, during COVID, seemed to be quite reasonable. Yeah, so they seem to be quite yeah. reasonable in adopting work practices with work from home, hybrid work arrangements, stuff like that. Um, so, so, so I, my impression was that Siemens kind of changed their management style to a more emphasizing way of of dealing with their people i mean they, i never experienced them as ruthless or anything but um i i thought it it has gotten even even better and there's a new generation of managers recently that seem to be very personable from anything i see on linkedin and what have you oh i mean there have been changes uh you know and there are different individuals over time um who, who each have their own own style. Certainly, I think Siemens um, handled COVID amongst the best. Um, the the company was fortunate that um, its IT infrastructure had been well developed for remote working before COVID. Mm. Um, it was uh, mainly because of people traveling, but um, you know we could all pick up our laptops and work from, from any Siemens office anywhere in the world and, and also, you know, from any hotel room anywhere in the world. And, and that really does position you quite well. Um, and certainly, although, you know, I think everybody found it a little bit shaky in the early days because the, the, the traffic uh, had shot up. You know, there's a lot more people doing it simultaneously. But 
uh, that was a relatively smooth um, process. And um, the, the, the company's early commitment to what they call the new normal um, and, and integrating working from home as a, as a, a standard part of the, the working environment. Um, yeah, I think it helped people adapt. I think that the managers um, adapted to the new reality of, of dealing with remote teams and, and things like that. But it was always a, a, a something of a feature with the organization. And um, yeah, I think it stood us in, 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 in good stead at, at, at that, that time. Um, yeah, I think the whole world is is now adjusting to the, the post-COVID situation. You see this um, push to get back to the office. It, it's, it was interesting that some elements of, of productivity went up. People with a clearly defined task, given some peace and quiet, not having the wasted time of commuting um, could be highly productive in, in some tasks. Um, elements of, of quality um, were not such a positive impact because there was sort of nobody looking over your shoulder or nobody at your elbow um, to discuss and you would find yourself going down the wrong path for longer until mm. you submitted a piece of work and then they said, oh no, you've, you've misunderstood, you've gone in the wrong direction. Um, onboarding, taking on new staff, integrating them into a team, very, very difficult unless you've got face-to-face -face interaction. You can take very well qualified people, um, great, great CVs, um, but what they don't know is how we do things around here. And um, left to themselves, they'll do it the way they did it in their last job. Um, which can cause all sorts of problems whilst being perfectly valid and, and these are very skilled and, and knowledgeable people. But if you don't know how we, we do it around here, if you don't know intimately our specific technology around here, you know, you can go off down the wrong path and, and that, that can be expensive. So uh, that blend of face-to-face of -face and remote, remote working is what everybody has to deal with now. Yeah. You you still spent over two years in the workforce after the initial big impact of COVID with lockdowns and stuff ebbed off. Uh, have you noticed any notable changes in the in the work behavior? Say a larger transition to a more hybrid form of work where yes, people do come back to the office, but maybe not five days a week. But what I found during COVID is that a lot of people, including myself, they, they got used to that uh, new situation where you don't travel anymore because you're not allowed to. Um, so you stay at home and suddenly you realize, oh, wait a minute, that's actually quite nice. Yeah, it's, it's actually quite nice not to... Uh, spend too much time in airports and, and launches and on airplanes and, and so on. And, uh, so you don't have jet lag anymore. You are not that tired anymore. Your risk of catching some kind of bugs, which happened before COVID as well. Let's just face it. Uh, during a trip, uh, is, is down to zero. And and then the next thing you realize is that uh, depending on your task, as you already mentioned, your your pro productivity may go up. You, you realize that you managed to get as much work done in, say, five hours as you did previously in, in eight or maybe more than eight. Um, so that leaves you some time to interact with the family. And again, you say, well, that that's quite nice, actually. Yeah. So So I could get used to it. And then COVID is over you're supposed to go back to the office and then you say well wait a minute can we can we talk about the work arrangements here and then maybe it's enough if i come to the office say three days a week maybe instead of five have you noticed anything like that or like a like a, oh, a major trend absolutely i think that that conversation is taking place has taken place um over the last two two years uh, in in every organization um the whether it's uh Having to come in, having to come in or wanting to come in you know, two, three, four days a week. Um, 
yeah, it's that balance of, of, of hybrid working that's being negotiated. I, I think the shock for me was the first day I, I went into the office sort of post COVID and that commute, that first commute. And I thought, how did I ever do this? You know, uh, and but for me in Melbourne, it was like sort of an hour and 10 minutes going in in the morning and about 45 minutes coming home at night. Um, so much waste, so much boredom. Um, how did I ever put up with this? And how did the organization ever tolerate that sort of inefficiency of travel? Um, yeah, just however you look at whether you're paid for 40 hour, 50, 60 hour week. Um, that commute is is one way or another being factored into your availability for for, for work. Um, anyway, I, I I think that um, most organisations now have um, factored in some degree of hybrid working, whether it's one or two days a week, um, and uh, employees are <laughs> glad to have that kind of flexibility. Um, and I think any organization that insisted on, on five days a week without a clear, uh, a clear business need that the, that the employee understands, you know, if your customer service or, 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 or something like that, or maybe in, in a factory or whatever, um, any company that sort of pushes too hard on, on the, the being in the office, um, will lose stuff. Uh, yeah. It's, it's just, not accepted. Mm. Mm. Hi, this is Doc Frank again. Before you head off, I just wanted to let you know again of the arguably best CBTC conference that has ever been held, the CBTC World Summit 2023, with 18 speakers from 13 different countries. It was a mega event in September this year. And you now have access to the official recording where you can see all the presentations, all the question answers after the presentations, and even the VIP fireside chats that were exclusively for VIP attendees during the conference. But you can have all of this now, lifelong, on demand. You can watch it whenever you want, from wherever you want, and how often you want. Don't miss this opportunity and sign up to the best CBTC conference ever on docfranktraining.podia.com slash CBTC World Summit 2023. I repeat that, docfranktraining.podia.com slash CBTC World Summit 2023. If you want one recommendation from me on CBTC, that is it. The best content of the year by a mile. Don't miss it. Hi, it's Doc Frank again. I hope you liked today's episode. I like to keep it as simple as possible, so I only have one single request for you. If you like this podcast, please tell your friends and colleagues about it. That's all I want because that's a service that I'm providing to the industry and I would like as many people as possible to listen to this podcast and learn something from it. So please share. And until next time, keep it simple and bye for now. Thank you for listening.